Uh, and um, I thought it would be great for you all to be able to get a brush up or maybe a primer on on why it's important to have a music lawyer. I didn't think I needed a lawyer until I started working with George. Um, and um, and what the important deals are. So this is going to be a little different from what we usually do. Um, we're going to keep questions, your questions for the <clears> end. <throat> Uh, what George is going to do is going to do basically a lecture on the cornerstone deals of the music business today. So we're going to talk about record deals. We're going to talk about um, music producer and mixer agreements. We're going to talk about publishing. Um, and um, and I'm going to let him talk. And he's just going to talk to you. And then you can gather your questions in the question poll thingy. And let's make sure that the questions pertain to what George is discussing. This is a really vast um, subject matter with lots of little niche things that everybody wants to know about. That's not the point of this. The point of this is for you all, um, our Pyramix community at large, to have an understanding of who the players are and what the deals can be and how they function. And that's going to be done more in a lecture format mm -hmm. than in the usual Q&A format that, that we've had on this broadcast because it's a more complicated um, subject matter. It's not 2 dBs at 60 hertz on the bass drum. This is really something that's really important for you guys to understand long term if you're going to be a professional or um, if, if you are aspiring to be a professional in the music business. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to bring George Stein on screen. He should be here around. This is George. Hi, George. Hey, um, thanks for joining us. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically shrink my video and put you front and center. And then you can just talk to, to the people um, and, and do your lecture. I may jump in and interject, or if you have, if you need me, I'm here. I'm just very small in the corner of the screen. Uh, oh, and uh, I'm, I'm here, um, just call me on, or maybe I'm, I may like, like barge on and ask a question that I think is really important. And then I will um, you know, monitor the chat room and everything and make sure everybody follows. So take it away, George, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Fab. It's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you a little about, um, let's talk about me, We're talking about what an entertainment lawyer does and what an entertainment lawyer is. Uh, an entertainment lawyer is not someone that just does deals with you. Um, he's an advisor. He's a consultant. Uh, he's, an, he's a go-to person. Uh, to to make you understand what the business is and and what you get what you're getting into and maybe what you're not getting into. One of my one of my primary roles is to protect people from doing bad deals as well as help them um, enter into good deals. So an advisor, consultant, um, and go-to person. And then of course, what I do when there's an actual deal, I negotiate the deal uh, with the with the other with the the with the other side on my client's behalf. Uh, today we'll be talking about the cornerstone deals in the music business. It's going to be a fly through um, lecture, fly over lecture. Um, beside being an entertainment lawyer, I'm also a graduate professor at NYU where I teach uh, once a once a week um, deals that I do for breakfast every every day and every, every week. Now, that's one of the advantages of a school like NYU. They take, I'm not an academic, but they call on people like myself, be adjunct professors um, to, to share um, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis with, um, with the students and in this case with, with you. The cornerstone deals in the music business are record deals, producer and they follow producer mixing agreements and deals, uh, publishing and management. I call those the, uh, the, the cornerstone deals. When this is over, what I hope is that you will know a lot more generally about, believe it or not, in an hour or 45 minutes than most people that are, that are actively veterans in the music business know in terms of the broad scope. When they're, generally what happens when people are in the music business, they know their area. 
people in record de- in record companies know record deals. They they know how that works. They don't know publishing. They don't management. They don't know management. And the same good thing goes for people in publishing or the people in management. They know what they do, but you'd be surprised how little they know in in outside of that area. Even though they might put up a big, a, a good front, they don't. Um, we'll. We'll talk about we'll talk about that very very quickly. Now, what what I do is I'm a, what's called a, a transactional lawyer. A transactional lawyer is a, is a lawyer that doesn't go to court, but he does deals. Um, the, the the lawyers that go to court are called litigators. There's a role for for everybody. Litigators usually come later when there's a problem with deals and someone breached a contract or did some a really bad thing. And, and 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 things go downhill. I like to think of what I do as a transactional attorney a little more positively. When I do deals, and I it's it's the beginning of the deals. Even though I see the deals through, even uh, in the middle and sometimes to the end. Uh, but it all starts out, you know, like a love fest. If people are getting engaged, they want to sign a, a contract, a marriage contract, if you will, and 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 do a do a deal. So it's kind of positive, generally, and that's that's ninety percent of of what I do. But leading that up to that, the clients come in or speak to me on the phone or we email, and they and I get them to understand what they're doing and why they're doing and where we're going with this and what the end game is and the middle game in the beginning, because there's a there's a, there's a transition. Uh, we'll talk about people, some of the people I've represented, just to give you an idea. It's got, I'll mention three that I'm um, that you might know of. Uh, <clears throat> Lou Reed, uh, years ago when I was young, younger, a couple of years younger. Um, Jeff Buckley, uh, Lana Del Rey. Um, um, Lou, I wasn't his first um, lawyer, but Jeff. Um, I was his first lawyer and only lawyer through his brief but majestic uh, career before he uh, tragically passed passed away. And I was his manager also. Um, I started out as his lawyer and then we segued into to management because interestingly enough, I wanted to, uh, I, I represented many managers and I was advising managers and I was saying to myself, you know, I could do this. Uh, and then I was looking for the right act, and of, it was amazing. I mean, it was like like Jeff Buckley, if the people who know who he is, because he, um, he's been gone with, uh, for a while, but he sang and made put Hallelujah on the map and many great songs, and his album Grace uh, is, uh, is recognized as one of the top 25 all-time great rock albums. Uh, and then... Uh, so that made me a better lawyer for the, for the ma- vast majority of people that I that I that I that I represent because what I am able to give them is what I know and I know more than most lawyers know without patting myself on the back too much because I've lived I've I've lived the deals that I make um, and then uh, Lana Del Rey, right from the beginning, right from the beginning of the of her career. And let me do as an aside because she's probably watching. Is this young girl, in, in Atlanta called Isabella Maddox. Um, this is a shout out to Isabella that I am going to bat for her. Now I'm on the now I'm on the record. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about deals, record deals, record deals is the, probably the cornerstone of the cornerstone deals. Uh, even though you don't have to have one these days, it used to be the record companies were the gatekeepers. Um, the good news is now anybody can put out the record. Before, if you wanted a record out there, you really needed a record company. So the good news is that everybody can put a record out even without a record deal. The other side, the bad news is that everybody can put out a record. It's um, the, the, the flip side of it. So there's a lot of noise out there. But if you look in the billboard charts and you look at generally the charts, most of what you see and what the thing, um, everything that rises above the noise, most of the time, 90% of the time, 99% of the time even, is, um, 
is not not in the indie artists. I'm not talking about people with an independent label, but self um, self released artists. Those are not um, um, those are not generally the people you see. Generally, the people on the charts. And there's a reason that that people enter into record deals, and even with major record deals these days, because they have the resources. And if you look at the charts, you know, major at Billboard charts now, you will see you'll see that almost all of them are or with major labels and then you'll see in maybe another label and that was an indie an indie, indie label or a, a, um, this self-owned label that that they set up for 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 the sake of business um partnered partnered up with okay what are the um what are the, the core terms of a, of a of a record deal it really boils down to exclusivity you're, you're committing to the record to the record company for a number of albums, um, and it's and it's um, it's how much, what are the, what are the advances, how much you're getting, what are the, what are the royalties, um, and then a million other things in a in a usually a fifty to eighty page single space contract um, that will take a lawyer um, if he's really reading everything carefully likely days to go through because I can't read 80 pages of fine print. And I'm always looking for that little hidden sentence or little hidden paragraph um, that um, would uh, would escape um, your notice um, because you're not trained to, to find it. So how long do these deals last? Well, um, a, a major record company and again, all record deals are exclusive. You sign to a record company. You're not an employee. You're an independent contractor, but you're exclusively signed signed to them. You can't record for anybody else. You can't record anything, even for yourself, outside of their umbrella. That's 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 a deal. That's the understanding. That's what you get paid for with in terms of an advance and 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 money. Oftentimes, you have to assign your um, assign me transfer your um, ownership of the masters uh, to the to the record company that's slowly changing. But I'm ch saying changing that it used to be for the life of copyright, which was a which was a long, long time, like almost practically a lifetime. Um, but now there's more, much more room, not a guarantee to to ask for a reversion at some point, uh, maybe maybe seven years after the term is up or 15 years is after the term up is the term is up record deals hate that they hate it uh, why because they want catalog they want catalog forever they want to own something forever understandable understandable um but with um it's now with um more intense competition and just maybe maybe standards changing it's worth trying for it's, it's, if, if they say no, okay, tried. Um, sometimes if I try that and it's and the, and the record deal is the only game in town and there's no competition and no bidding wars going on. So I have one offer for, on behalf of a client that uh, is the only offer. I'm probably not going to blow it. Well, I can tell you I'm not going to blow it. And I'll advise a client not to blow, blow it because we have to give the copyright away um, of the sound recording um, uh, in, in a sense, almost in perpetuity, uh, because what, what's, what's the option? Um, you have a chance to swing and, and go for the bleach and, and swing for the bleachers, um, or you might, you know, you know, take years to find something else, if ever. And, you know, time is precious. Um, there's, a, there's a window usually for, for artists. Um, youth is important. You, know, you don't want to be looking for your, you know, for your, for your big deal with a major at that 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 in your thirties or forties. It's really a young man and woman's game or young band's game. It's just it's just it's just a fact of it's a fact of life. Okay, so how long is long in terms of what is the contract? Um, how is it how is it structured? Usually, it's a guarantee not of years, but of of the, of the number of albums. Uh, and typically, it'll be five to seven, which will show up. The record company will want seven records. They want the, the longest commitment possible. They want to lock up the artist for seven records. Uh, and the artist 
it's really in the artist's interest to keep it as short as possible. It's a little, little counterintuitive, but shorter is better because if you only have a commitment to five albums and it goes to five albums, you're a success. And at that point, when there's a new contract to be negotiated, either with it, with the original um, um, record company or the later record or the or another third party record company, because you're free to you're a free agent to do a deal with somebody else at that point, you are you're 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 a proven you're a proven quantity. Um, so you really want to keep these deals as short as possible. The record company, of course, isn't just going to roll over. They'll they'll fight or they'll argue, not a fight. Um, but it's kind of a little bit of a game. Um, and sometimes you meet in the middle and you say, I wanted five, they wanted seven. Okay, six six albums. And I'll know that if he's, if the artist is a success, um, then after two records, I'll be able to renegotiate. And you ask why can I um, why will I be able to renegotiate when I when I when it looks like I have a contract locked in because the reality of of these kind of deals is that the rec that you've earned the right to ask for a higher royalty and more and bigger advances and more creative control uh, because you're you've proven yourself and you're making the record company record uh, money and everybody's fat and happy but the record company is now looking to keep you happy. And if you're, and if they're looking to keep you happy, that empowers your representative, your lawyer, empowers me if I represent you, for example, um, to go back and say, listen, he's she, he, they, they proven themselves, they're making you tons of money, let's renegotiate. Uh, and then, and then they'll say to me, well, there's no free lunch, we don't have to. And I'll say, well, you know, maybe we won't go, we, we you know, we may have, have, scheduling problems and it may be delayed. I mean, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a power play, but you know, it's also also reality. And I'll say, you want to keep him, you're happy. And he's proven himself, we deserve more money. And they'll say, okay, but I want another, uh, there's no free lunch. Um, I want another, they'll say, I want another, um, if we did a six album deal, I want another album tagged on. And so that way they get, they get something and you get something and everybody goes away goes away satisfied. Now, when I talk about um, um, five to seven album deals, that's not a commitment that the record company is, is, is making. Um, that's what they, if they, it's, it's bro records, the record deals are broken into options for them, not your option to continue. You're locked in if they exercise your option, if they want to continue. So you start with a commitment of, of typically of one record they don't have to release it if they don't like it because it's a pay or what's called a pay or play clause. Well, like if they don't decide to play it, put it out, release it, then they'll they'll pay you something that's built into the deal, and and they 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 dropped you. You've heard that expression. The the artist got dropped, the band got dropped, and the the um, it's over. But you're also free. You don't know on future albums. But if they exercise an option because they like what the first album did commercially, what they did, oh, and, and the second album, the third al album, and every, after every album, they have a window, a period, to exercise an option um, to, to continue on to the, um, to the cap, which is either five, six, or seven, seven albums. With indie labels, um, it's, usually, it's usually shorter. It's two, three, um, four albums. Um, it just the just it's just the way it is. They don't have the clout to demand as much. They don't have the they're not offering as much because they don't have the um, um, they don't have the, the checkbook to write those kind of um, big checks. So you do kind of small you do kind of smaller deals. Uh, what else goes into it? Well, that, that, we talk, we talk, that was that was talking about the time. Uh, and these deals can go out. Can you imagine if you go out to seven albums? I mean, it could be a year, year and a half, two years between albums. So it's a seven album deal. It could easily be a 14 year contractual relationship with the, with the, with the record company. So just know that these are, these are long-term deals. You can't do these deals by yourself. Um, you'd be foolish, a fool um, to do it by, by yourself. And you never want anybody to say to you, and this is, a, this is something you should always remember, when anybody says to you, well, this is standard, especially when you're doing these cornerstone deals, it's nothing is standard. There's nothing standard. And if they, if anybody says, take it or leave it, this is our standard deal, 
you really have to um, you have to leave it because you're you're asking for misery um, for yourself and an, an unhappiness and and any legitimate um, company that's trying to do a deal with you knows what it it what it what it means to an artist to sign uh, knows what a commitment it is because you really may be committing your youth your best years um, to this label and will be willing to ne negotiate. So, and then these deals, I'm not talking about an overview, but there are literally, you know, hundreds of things that can be discussed in these, these deals that go beyond the most important things we're talking about now, which is how long and how much. Another important issue, it's, 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 it's lower than that, is creative control. Do you, who make, who, who chooses the singles? Who chooses the, 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 the music? Um, well, uh, again, this sometimes goes off the, off the contract. It depends on your relationship with the label. It depends on your relationship with the A&R person that signs, that signs you. But you have to recognize that the A&R person that signs you may not, or that brought you in, may not be the record A&R person you have because people come and go. Um, they quit and let go on to other, de uh, other jobs, or they get fired all the time. And all of a sudden, you're left with a new team um, or a new liaison, new key, new key player. So um, while personal relationships are very important going into the deals, understand that those personal relationships may not be there um, in, the, in the future for, those re for the reasons I just, I just mentioned. Um, so creative control, when I say it goes off the contract, is that you can have a handshake and an understanding that, oh, you have, you have full creative control, you know, uh, but you have to get in writing and it's almost impossible to get in writing. I, um, um, I can't get into too many you know, particulars with names, but one of my clients, um, name clients that I mentioned earlier, had, had creative control, which was unusual. And even that was like kind of a handshake. It was, it was mentioned in the contract, but I had the commitment from the record company president that um, this was going to be a special, special project with this for a special, special artist, and that that, uh, and that artist would have creative control. And this was a major label, and to their credit, um, they, they, they kept to it. When there were certain, certain music that they definitely, certain songs that they wanted the album that my, my client didn't want to um, put on, and, and, he, and they did it to their credit, they accepted it. That's not necessarily the case, but it, got, it, 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 it does happen and it can happen. Uh, but it's kind of creative control is something you should be aware of and have a feel for when it, when it, when it goes on. Sometimes it's not as big a deal as you think, excuse me, because um, the record companies know what they're signing when they sign you. Um, they know what kind of music, what kind of thing. It almost kind of protects them in the, in the sense that um, if you kind of change your genre, you know, which is uh, a big risk, and some, um, uh, uh, then they they can say they can say no. But yeah, I, I put my eyes up because I'm thinking out loud. There's so many, so many cases when something you know, the record company said yes, um, or they said no early on. But when the record cut, when the when the artist later on sold a million or you know went platinum on the second and third album or the second album the third album they wanted to change the genre the record company wasn't in a position at that time because there was a power shift the, the artists became more powerful and they proved themselves and the record company you know said okay you know you made us a lot of money we're not going to make you unhappy now maybe we would have pushed you around when you were a baby artist but now we won't so 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 things so, so things change uh, let me just look at my notes for a second to make sure that um, I'm covering everything for on, on on record deals. This is this is really. Uh, let me come back on for a second. Yeah, um, just just to um, since we are we are wrapping up a little bit on the on the record deals. I think that this is very interesting, super concise, very well organized information, and I'm sure everybody learned something. I th um, I think it's important to note from my experience with you. Um, that everything is up for grabs, right? It's not like there's a template and then there are rules and laws, right? Um, you, it's basically a power play, like you said, correct? 
Well, there's a, there is a structure and there are standards, um, but within those standards, um, you can you you can negotiate and you can and you can and can change things and you can try and you can horse trade. Oh, uh, you know, I couldn't give you that, but you have to give me this. You know, and I'm, when you're dealing with the lawyers on the other side, they're human, um, and they're not, not. Most of them aren't the bad guys and the guys in the black hats that you know you that you think they are, and they appreciate music, um, and especially, uh, you know, listen. If you have an artist that everybody thinks, okay, this is a legacy artist, then they're going to be more comfortable making change, making changes. If it's a, just say they just found a hit and they said, okay, we don't know about, we don't have any confidence in the future, but we want to get on board now with this hit and make some, uh, you know, make some money. You may have less, um, you know, to negotiate because they'll, they'll, they'll be thinking, listen, take it or leave it. But the, the better the artist is and the more potential, um, then the more, ch you know, the more chances you are. And I've, you know, I've learned this over the years. There's no harm in asking. And sometimes I've been surprised and I hesitate I, when I was younger, you know, and I was still learning the ropes because just like, you know, being a young lawyer is like being a doctor. Maybe you don't really want a really young lawyer, you know, doing it for the for, for the first time. Uh, maybe I, that's a little self-serving at, at my age, but um, it um, it helps to you know have learned you know what works and what doesn't work over 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 the years. And also, as you get older, you have a little more gravitas because of your experience um, to say, um, you know, with, with with I'm dealing with someone that's thirty, and let's say for argument's sake, I'm thirty-five. I'm not. Um, I have more, you know, they kind of defer to me. So it kind of works better as I, you know, lawyers sometimes get better with age because uh, they have, you know, so much more to, 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 to um, experience to fall back on. Absolutely. Yes, I think within standards, for example, the standards are still five to seven on, on a major, major label deal. That is a standard. Uh, but I could do four maybe if it's someone that's going to, you know, making them drop dead. And if there's another offer coming in, this where, you know, um, um, competition is a beautiful thing. If you're getting into a bidding war, which is very rare, usually there's one label that believes in you and they'll take a shot with you. But if you get into a bidding situation or a competitive situation with two labels, you're in, you're in the, you're in the a, a wonderful position to play them off against each other. And every, it's not a ne negative thing to do. You'll just say, "Listen, I have someplace else to go," and they they will probably won't guarantee it, you know do it. Though I want to go with you, but I need this, and you know they they, they hear my telephone call, and that's what yep. goes on. Yes. Yes. I, 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 so, um, is it is it okay? We know five to seven. Before you move on to the producer agreements and mixer agreements um, section of your your information. Um, what kind of um, percentages are practiced these days with artists? Is that still a standard that we're that we're stretching? Yes, yes, yes. And the standard with with an artist is in the twelve um, to fifth to fourteen percent range. Uh, that's been my my experience, um, and that is um, twelve percent of the um, of the uh, basically the PPD, but it's basically the wholesale price. Um, of the of the record, and that might might translate in terms of dollars um, to if you sell an album, but it's not an album world anymore. But if if anybody sells an album, any it might be a dollar to a dollar fifty, dollar twenty to a dollar fifty an album. Uh, again, if you have a bidding bidding situation, you know you might go higher. If they want to say take it or leave it, it might go a little 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 lower. But that's the that's the range. So my job is to get it as high as possible. Their job, they have bosses, is to make more money, and they make more money by by getting as low as possible. But there's again, there's that there's that range. And so, what are the what are the what is it, what is the, what is the money? I'm glad you mentioned that, Fab, because you brought me back. You know, we talked about the the royalty, but it, what what is it, what what money comes in? There are typically advances. 
certainly advances with major record company deals and certain and with larger independents and, and mid-sized independents they can they can throw some, some money at the artist for the artist's pocket um, it's an advance against the royalties. It's an, it's an advance against if someone pays you fifty thousand or a hundred thousand or one hundred fifty or half a million. It doesn't really matter. Um, you, you get it as high as you can and whatever the market will bear. But that's an advance against your royalties. So the, if they pay you a hundred thousand dollars, the first hundred thousand dollars of royalties that comes in is the word of art is recouped. The record company recoups it and just pays themselves back. Fair enough. They gave you an advance of your money. Now, if they drop you, this is this is one of the beautiful things. I mean that um, that one one of the major things that goes the artist in the artist way. If they drop you, it's very important that these advances be um, be non refundable. And since most artists get dropped sooner or later, and unfortunately mo most of them do too. Really, the the um, the amount of artists that sign to labels that don't see it through to five or six or seven or most, the vast majority, 95%, 97% don't make it through. So they, they, they make it through the second or third because the record probably please them or their first or those records do well. But as soon as, as soon as it slides down and it's no longer profitable, then they're, they're out. The record company can be heartless that this way. It really is a business. And as much as they, whenever the record company talks, please um, be, be be wary of the word family. You know, well, we're family. You're not family. You're not family. It's a business. You'll be dropped like, watch this, like that. Um, if when it's when they decide that it's over and it doesn't make monetary business sense for them. So, you know, you try and keep good relations with them. You make friends. You know, yes, you go out to eat, you go out to dinner, you go to weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that. But Really, at the end of the day, it's a business friendship in, in, those kind of, in those kind of situations. Not all the time, but, you know, when you hear family, don't take it at face value. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, I'm sorry. This is, this oh, is so great. Advance, advance in, in royalties. And again, with success, you can bump those up. You don't have to like get out of the deal to to pump it up. So if I if I if I go platinum, my artist goes platinum. I, I personalize it. If, if the artist goes platinum at um, on the second album or the first album, the second album, the third album, at some point I will you know weigh in and say, listen, I signed a so-called baby act with you, but it's not us. This is some baby, you know. Now it's a it's a big it's a big big you know hundred you know hundred and fifty pound. 200 pound hitter. Um, I want to renegotiate. And again, I want what, what is, I want better royalties. I want, you know, more creative control. I want uh, a bigger advance. Mm -hmm. uh, and also advances in royalties get, can get bumped up. If you, uh, in terms of the original contract, for better renegotiation, if I do it in my original contract, there is, the, is anticipatory increases with success. Which so it shows that they recognize that you're entitled to it if you make it for yep. them yeah, yourself, yeah. your partners, and that's it. When you're when you when it's when you and it's all working, it is a family, and it's you know and then it's a happy marriage. And when it's not working, it ain't no family, it ain't no happy marriage. So you have to you know you have to think of it. You have to think of that that way. But when things are good, you can bump things up in, in terms of the original negotiations. And this is something that you know you don't see the benefit of that when you sign the, you sign your name to these deals. But it's been negotiated in there that when you go if you go if you sell uh, two hundred fifty thousand or five hundred thousand, um, it just bumps up half a point to a point. Um, and the same thing with the advances, another $50,000, another $100,000. So the deal that you end up getting paid under is not the deal that you originally signed, but it's part of that deal you originally signed that just improved because you pre-negotiated that. Okay, thanks, friends. You're, you're welcome. I'm gonna shrink myself and you can move on to uh, your you next question. Producer in in mixer. Yes, let's go ahead and producer in mixer because they say okay, you sign you sign your deal. Oh, let me now talk about indie. Let me talk about indie um, indie labels for a while. There's also a new model. There's another model. It's not so new. It's been around for many many years, but where a record company an indie label uh, can pay can afford to to pay you. 
Uh, and maybe you want to go the indie route because you think maybe it's more of a family. You know, I personally like major labels because I think my, you know, you you want to you want to go for it, and um, you have you have, um, while it may you maybe feel like more of a family with um, with smaller labels, it's also you know it's just a fam it's like family resources. The, the, um, it's not a they don't have the resources to market and to promote your your record. Uh, so oftentimes they don't even have enough money to pay you a livable advance. And you know, once you're an, when you're an artist, you know, a livable advance is important because you really have to quit your day job. You can't you can't go on tour and have a day job. You can't go into the studio for you know for months on end and have a day job. Um, so you have to be able to afford to do it. When they can't um, pay you, like like sometimes indies can't, they do a different model. So they don't they become part real partners. They don't pay you a royalty. They pay you. They and then they pay you. They split it 50 50 with you. I'll say whatever we can't pay you, or we can pay you something very modest. But we're partners. Um, we'll um, all the all the all the money that comes in instead of you getting 10, 11, or 12, or 14 or 15 percent. Now you're getting 50 percent. Well, that sounds great, but it's 50 percent of a smaller pie because they don't have typically they don't have the resources um, to get you to the, that high level. But there's something to be, there's something to be said for it. What they um, uh, what comes off the top? So it's 50 50 is 50 50 after they recoup the expenses. You're not asked to make the record, not asked to go into, into the studio. Um, but you, um, so it's recognized that they will lay out money. They just don't have the money to pay, necessarily pay you. But when money starts coming in because some, there are record sales um, and streaming and so forth, they will pay the first monies uh, back to make themselves whole for what they laid out, and then it's 50-50. Um, you got it, there's one thing to watch out on, on it. Um, and one of the kind of the rackets I've always thought on, on major deals is that when you, um, uh, you know what's recoupable, what the record companies pay recoup from you, they recoup all recording costs. So while they lay out the recording costs in major label deals, you want success the artist pays for success and this is kind of standard um, and hard to break it may not be fair but just recognize that this is you know something that exists that they pay all the recording costs that they laid out so you ended up making the making their own record with great with great success you can try and negotiate or with a, um, an important bidding situation you can negotiate that that they don't they don't Pay themselves back 100% that you become partners in a sense, and they will they will they, they will pay themselves back 50%. Not easy to get, but I, but I, but it's something to consider and something to again to try, based on your um, um, negotiating power. Now, back to the Indies. We have to go back and forth again. The Indies, I said they they 50-50, um, um, but one of the one of the rackets with indies, and sometimes you have to look at the fine print. And I'll say, well, wait a second, what's that? Is that they'll say that the record the record costs are are, are recoupable from the artist. And then my reaction to that is, whoa, wait a second. I thought we were family. I thought this is a 50-50 deal. We we're splitting everything 50. But now I'm finding that you know with, with success, I'm paying for the record company. I'm paying for the record. No, I want, if, it's, if you're telling me it's 50-50, I want it to be 50-50 across the board and under and under the seat, if you will, with the recording costs being split 50-50. Okay, now, I've, now I feel comfortable. I've to, told you a lot about rec, record, record deals. Now we'll go to producing deals, which is in a sense the next step. You have a record, you have a record to be put to put out. Um, or you're doing just, or you're doing it yourself, and you're looking for a producer and and and, and maybe a mixer. Uh, and how does how do, how does that work? Well, it's again, there's this is a there's this commonality to these deals, and the commonality is time, and and how and how the producer gets gets paid. Just like the, the record company, there was a time, five albums, six albums, seven albums, and how does the artist get paid? The producer works for the for the artist. Unlike with the record company, 
it looks like the record the artist works for the record company. Um, the, the the artist hires the producer and and the mixer in separate deals because it's usually it's set, usually they can be separate individuals if the producer isn't a producer and the mixer. Um, and your question is how how much do they get get paid? And we're flying through this. They get paid. There's a standard on on rock and pop. Producers get three three points. Um, three points is just another word of three percent of the same of the same kind of royalties that the artist that the record company pays the um, um, the producer. And the contract will say if there's a record deal, we um, will pay the um, the artist through the record company. Um, the artist is the deal is with the artist with the with the um, with the artist, but then the artist instructs the record company to pay the producer based upon the, the, the deal points. And the deal points is if the artist is getting 12 points, or well, let's say 13 points, the producer, the artist directs the record company to pay the producer um, um, three points. And that's pretty standard in rock and pop. It's more in, it's, it's, it's more in hip hop. Rock and pop, it's, it's, um, it's um, um, three points sometimes, but more and more you can go, you can go to four with a, with a, the big producer and you know and they really are they that, that artist really in the record company really wants you you can go to you can go to five but three is still the standard based on the same um computation of royalties that's in the that's in the artist record deal there's one exception and it works very well for producer and mixers is that while artists make their um their royalties only after recruitment of recording costs um, the artist, uh, and then it start, they start to get paid, get paid royalties. With producers, just tradition, you'd think that it would be the same, they get paid from record one after the recruitment of recording costs. Uh, and so um, that's, a, that's a great benefit to, um, to the producer. Now, let me just um, talk about the bigger picture of royalties. If the artist gets 13 points on his deal, let's see how the math will work out of making this a simple deal. Um, that's called the all-in deal. And it's recognized that out of the 13 points, uh, the, um, thir the part of that 13 points will be spent to, 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 take out, to, to sign on the producer. The producer mm -hmm. gets three points. Um, the artist then gets the net of that out of the 13. So basically the record company is holding 13 points for the artist, but it knows that three points or a producer royalty is earmarked for the producer. Mm -hmm. So um, the artist doesn't end up getting paid 13 points. The artist after the producer is paid three points ends up getting paid by the record company thir uh, 10 points and the record company is, is laying out 13 points altogether. Um, and they pay, they'll pay the record, the producer directly or the mixer directly their royalty, and then what the balance will be paid to the um, to to the artist. Uh -huh. um, so um, that's that's how they get paid, and advances are negotiated, uh, just uh -huh. like it, just like the artist, where the record company will um, um, the or, you know, the artist or the record company will commit to paying. Um, and, and a certain amount negotiated amount to the producer and or the and or the, and the mixer, and um, then and recoup, recoup that, and then pay from record one once recording course recouped, and then it, it's time is different because while a record comp, record deal is 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 um, is is um, the term is long term and is it means the length of the contract is long five albums six albums seven albums potentially the the producer agreement and the mixer agreements are one-offs right you just commit to a certain amount of time at a certain place um, to record that that piece of work whether it be a single or an ep or an album and then you then you go on with your with your lives so the term is in that commitment you just have to make sure that it's Either exclusive during that period of time, or um, and, and that is a priority for to uh, for the for the producer. And at what studio? You have to say where where it's going to be mixed. I mean, where's going to be produced? Is it going to be produced in the Bahamas or in Tokyo or in New York City? You know, and, and what's what and what, what studio? Um, mm -hmm. So there's there's the time frame and there's the money. And the mixer is the same kind of concept as a producer, but mixers get um, get 
um, get less. Typically, the standard is about is about a, is at a point with the same um, retroactive to um, record one, but the same issues and same questions. Where is that mixing going to take place? You know, usually that can be you know maybe off site. The artist mm -hmm. doesn't look to be there, um, so maybe it's a little simplified. But um, that's producing. Mm -hmm. How are we doing for time? Okay, we're doing, we're doing great. We're, I, have, um, I have a couple of questions that I think are going to resonate with um, with the crowd uh, because a lot of the people here are um, are going to be producers and mixers because um, this is pure mix .net, you know. Um, so um, the um, first, it's important to know that a lot of people don't know that what you just mentioned the 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 percentage from that goes to the producer is actually um, taking away from the artists. Correct. So that that creates a certain dynamic with the artists, um, and um, and uh, I, in my experience, when you've been negotiating uh, my deals, but in my experience, it's something that it's great to have a third party negotiate because if you're uh, in the room with someone and trying to be creative, right? And th this, I'm I'm basically preempting a question for you. If you're in the room with someone and being creative, you can't really say, hey, you know. I'm going to take four points on this because I'm working my butt off. Um, so that means your share is going to be four points less from already a pretty meager share. So um, it's really, it's a very difficult situation. So it's great. It's been great for me, just so the guys know, guys and girls know. Um, I know you for what, 15, 20 years, 20 years. Right. Um, and we, I was an artist and I was like at music conference, you were at a music conference and then we, we hit it off. Um, and um, and then I didn't hire you for 12, 13 years, which is just Yeah, and and um, for the longest time, I just couldn't bring myself, and this is where my question comes. Um, I couldn't bring myself. I, I just told myself, I I don't need this. I'm, I have an agreement with this person. We understand each other, and I never I never got screwed, you know. Uh, and then things happened uh, where I got screwed. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, where basically I helped make very big records um, and I de either didn't get credit or didn't get a royalty. And the people I worked with were doing extremely, extremely well financially off that one record and I got nothing, right? And that's when my, um, my mind changed about hiring you uh, to negotiate for me. Here's the question. A lot of people feel that it changes the relationship. And there's one of those questions exactly here. And I know where it comes from in the, in the question role. Uh, it's not being upvoted, but it's important. It's like, um, uh, it's in here and it says, uh, it said, I, I can't find this so many uh, of this stuff. It's like, do you need to have paperwork to collaborate? Like if you coll collaborate with somebody, do you need to have paperwork? And so my question to you is, you know what happens when two people are in a room and then they have to have an agreement, right? Um, so is it important to have an agreement? Uh, does it have a way that, that, is there a way to bring, have, make an agreement together between two collaborators without it being odd and weird? How do you deal with that yourself? Well, uh, y yes, they, 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 they can, I mean, Songwriting, we'll get into publishing, is probably the easiest way to say, you know, we're going to have a club. You, know, you should have a collaboration, an agreement, and an understanding. Um, typically, people collaborate, they'll say, oh, it's 50 50. But you should have that in, in writing. And without an agreement, the default um, recognition of the law is, well, you know, it was 50 50 if you acknowledge it was a, a collaboration. Um, but I, I really, really think, and, but it can be anything. It could be 1090, it can be 25, 75, it can be, it can be, it can be anything. Um, it can, and it can be, doesn't necessarily have to reflect what the actual contribution is. It can be what the, um, what that person brings to the table, the collaborator that's getting the, the that wants a 50%, but only contributed 75%, but he has contacts and he has a reputation and he has a, he has a contact with this artist or things like that, which will entitle him to 50%. So, you know, oftentimes it's just easy to say, okay, it's 50-50. It's and you reckon sometimes when if you do lyrics, is that's recognized as 50% and music is recognized as 50% in terms of a collaboration, uh, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but I think in terms of 
doing it yourself is very uncomfortable when you when when your friends when your friends and your collaborators to discuss business and it's much easier and again i don't want to do self promotion for you know for myself as a lawyer or things like that but the practical reality is that you, you need it in writing and there's no way you can't do this at home yet. you can't do this alone at home kids don't try and do this at home because there are too many things that go even to a short form agreement um that you have to have a, a, a lawyer a lawyer do just like i'm not going to make a record even though i think it'd be pretty easy to make a record i should be a star um so you know for that for that reason also a lawyer is a buffer in the cushion and it's not like I'm talking to the other collaborator. I'm talking to the other collaborator's lawyer, and you know we we're more comfortable with doing that. That's what we do. Um, so we and it doesn't doesn't pull you in um, to that you know negative area poss a possibility. Because the lawyer, I may be friendly with him, but he's not my friend. You now we're doing business oh. together, and we're really trying to do the best thing for our clients. And sometimes. You know, I, as a lawyer, I think that sometimes the best thing to, you know, for my client is not necessarily to be over aggressive and get the, you know, the best possible deal where the other, other side feels crappy and taken advantage of or bled, you know, bled out. Um, I want the other side to be, you know, happy and to make this a copacetic relationship. And I'll say to my client, you know, for, the, for all these reasons, give him or her or them what they want in the long term, it'll run out, run, you know, it'll work out for you. Yeah, well, I can, so, I, yeah. these, are, these are all the reasons why you should, you, you should, you should do it. But there should be some kind of understanding and it should be um, put in, put in, put in writing. Um, something that would be useful for everyone. Um, from my personal experience, things started to get more steady and uh, easier and um, go up, up, up in, in quality in my relationship with people after I had um, George draft a um, standard user agreement. That was our first relationship. The first thing I could afford to hire George for was, hey, George, I'm, I'm making all these records for these labels. There's not enough money in the, in, in the budget for me to hire you on everything. Can you make me a standard producer agreement that I can recycle with all these indie guys and, and small labels? So George did that. And out of that came the fact that now everything, and I love the word, everything that I do is papered. That's, that's, uh, that's you call it, it, you are papered. I'm like, okay. Which means that <laughs> you're dressed. I am, everything that, um, everything that, every uh, label work that I do or anything that has any kind of, of potential, which by the way is dangerous. Everything has potential. You don't know what has potential. Um, so everything that I do goes through George and George papers it and then we sign and then we move yeah. on. And I can yeah. attest to the fact that it hasn't changed my relationship with people at all. If anything, um, it's, uh, it's generated more respect from the other side that said, you know what, this is great. You should talk to George. And um, and it's been great. So I just wanted to I wanted to to reassure the people here that going through um, a, um, a lawyer such as you um, to basically this, let's call it a way to confirm that everybody agrees um, is a very healthy thing to do. It doesn't have to be insanely expensive, and it's very necessary. Um, and it's a great stepping stone into the future. If I had called you on those two or three records that I did that went boof, um, my financial situation would be completely different um, than it is well, right you learned. now. Yeah. Well, thank exactly. you, Fab. Okay. Um, thank you, Fab. Makes you know, makes everybody able to relax when you get it when you get it you know when you get it papered as you as you as you put it in yeah. writing. Yeah. So and you, don't have to, and, you don't, you know, and you don't have to, you know, change your relationship. You don't have to go into difficult areas with, you know, the person you, you're stuck in a room with for, you know, a month. Yep. So let's um let's make sure that um, everybody can hear you talk about the publishing side of things because I think that's yeah, really very important. important. Very important in terms of you know, um, um, what the, what the deal is all about, what what the music business is all about. Publishing is 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 getting more and more important. It's, it's key. Um, what is publishing? The publishing is the control and administration of, of, of a song, of, of music. Uh, and initially, who controls the song? 
and who administers, which is, uh, registers a copyright, does the deals. It's the writer. The, the writer writes a song. He's, he's, he's legitimately the publisher. He's, publisher. he's self-published. He controls the song. It's his piece of property. He has a copyright. You don't have to register it to, it's a good idea to register your songs, but you don't have to register to be recognized as a copyright right holder. Um, he's the owner. Like he has a, like think of a copyright as a deed. You have, he's the owner of that, that, that song. Um, if he does a deal with an outfit that is a, that is in the publishing business, then they're known as publishers, you know, whether it be Warner Chapel or Sony ATV or Universal, you know, major publishers and all kinds of, and, and thousands and tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of, of, small, of smaller publishers. And what the, what, the, what the writer, and oftentimes the writer is also a band and the artist, it can be a singer song, mm -hmm. or it can be a standalone um, writer. If they can put it out themselves, I mean, they can be the self-published publisher, and you can join ASCAP and B or BMI and and the Harry Fox organization, and those those they will, in the, in the most basic sense, collect for you, um, but they won't promote you, they won't pitch you. Um, a publisher um, takes on the the, um, the responsibility of administering the songs, doing the deals for the songs, uh, making sure that you get the mechanical royalties from the from the from the record company, the performance monies from the um, radio performances and, 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 and television performances, and 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 sync licenses when it's on a radio, when it's on a uh, commercial or a movie or a television show, or a, a game or or a, a game. Um, uh, they will, will they will do all of those things, but you have to enter a contract with them. Mm -hmm. And the contract is again will do the same kind of common things. What are you giving them, and how much you're getting paid for it? Well, um, you're basically assigning control. Sometimes you're assigning assigning means turning over the copyright, um, or if not contractually, the control of the song. So it's theirs in their catalog to working with you with a, as a writer hopefully, um, to, um, to make money and, 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 um, and generate, um, um, generate um, in, income from that, from that song. Um, they sign a contract with you where you give them the right to do it and they will pay you a percentage of income that, that comes in. And this is one of my favorite lectures. I teach at NYU, so this is what this is out of my NYU lecture. Um, think of it in terms of how the money is split between a publisher and a writer and the writers. Think of picture a circle graph. Okay, split it down the middle. On the right hand side, write songwriter. Think of it in your head. Very very simple. And on the left hand side, think of a public of put down P is for the publisher. It's this is not the way it works now, but I have to give you the historical background of it. And so it's so simple. They would split the money 50-50. The publisher would say, Well, we're we're getting it out there. And the writer would say, um, well, I wrote the song. Or the writers, and they'll say, Well, okay, you know, I'm the business side and you're the creative side. You know, together. You know, we're a marriage, 50-50. Um, that's how it was. Now you don't do so you don't do full publishing deals or old-fashioned publishing deals. For many, many, many years, a generation or so, um, two generations, um, they've been you've heard co-publishing deals. Okay, co-publish co-publishing deals means that the publisher still controls the song, still administers the song. That hasn't changed, but the, the but the percentage of it is no longer 50-50. You take what was the, the publisher's side, which was 50%, and you cut that in half and you make that half into two quarters. And the upper quarter is called P for publisher. And the the lower quarter of the publishing side is goes into the is called SW, songwriter. So all of a sudden, the, co the, the, the songwriter, besides getting his 50%, that's sacrosanct, that's sacred. As a, as, a, as a writer, now that writer is getting a piece of the publishing income. So he's netting really that quarter plus that one half, and he's up to 
So it's pretty simple. Um, so, but it's very, very, it's very, you have to be very careful because sometimes some, some kind of scammy publishers or not so, you know, so honest publishers will say, well, we're doing a 50-50 split. And then you have to understand, and you say, well, wait a second, are you doing 50% of the whole pie or are you doing, you're recognizing that I already have 50% as a writer. Are you talking about 50, does that 50% mean 50% of the, of, the, of the publishing pie? So that it's 75, 25 as opposed to 50, 50. And so what lawyers do, even I do, and, and publishers, major public, lawyers for publishers, I will get on the phone and I'll say co-publishing, right? Or I'll say, uh, or, or if a purpose, or if an indie is saying to me, oh, so you know, it's a 50-50 publishing deal, I'll say, well, what is it? What do you mean by 50-50? Is it really 75-25 co-publishing? Or is it old-fashioned 50-50? And they'll have to say it's 50-50, and I'm not doing business with them, or they'll say, no, of course, George, you said, I'll say, of course, George, you fool, it's 75, it's 75%. And I'll say, fine, I wanted to be a fool, but I got 75%. And, you know, there's no stupid questions. Uh, uh, so that's, you got to understand, now it's co-publishing, you're entitled to 75%. So isn't that, isn't that, but you can see how it gets complicated in terms of what is, when you talk about 50%. And then it gets more complicated, what happens if there's two writers? Okay, well, you know, then what is, what's the collaboration agreement with them? If it's, is it 50-50? Well, then instead of getting 75%, then the writers are getting half of that because half of the writer's shares are going 75% cut in half, 37.5% to one writer, writer one, um, 30, um, 37.5% um, to writer two, which adds up to that 75% you know, publishing split we were just talking about, co-publishing split, and still and still twenty-five percent to the to the um, to the to the um, publisher. So nothing's changed. It's just that that, um, that circle graph just kind of got sliced up in more slices, and then it gets more complicated. What happens if the if one 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 co-writer wants to go to Warner Chapel and the other co-writer wants to go to Universal? Well, then the whole pie becomes two pies, and the writer is giving seventy-five twenty-five to um, to to Warner Chapel, but he's only giving half of the half of the gross money, and the other writer too is giving. 75, 25, but instead of being a hundred percent coming in, it's fifty percent coming in, controlled by two publishers that really then have to cooperate and coordinate in terms of administering that song. And then there's an advance. You, you hopefully, especially with major publishers, you want to get, uh, you know, a, as big as possible. You know, in the five figures, in the six figures, um, or more. You know, if there's a competitive situation, and and maybe you know this writer, you know, you know was self-published and and had a huge hit, and now is looking for a publisher, and it has so much money coming in that the publishers can can say, well, I can afford to pay you it, and look what you've done, uh, and um, you get the biggest biggest advance possible, just like you would from a record company, and again, that's typically recoupable um, from. Um, um, from monies collected by the by, from songwriter monies collected by the record company until they've recouped what um, they paid you as an advance, and then and if they drop you again, this should be a non-refundable. And all these deals, when he says advance, your lawyer should be saying such a simple thing: oh, advance right before in advance. I'm going to say non-refundable advance. <laughs> so that you don't get surprised when they drop you and you and you're in the red, and they'll say, "Well, wait a second. It says in advance, but it didn't say, you know, didn't didn't, didn't talk to whether it's refundable or, or non-refundable." And everybody understands that it should be non-refundable, but you have to clarify it. So important. Yep. So, okay. so I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Um, I don't want to okay. interrupt. But this is a good point. Um, I think there are some questions that are really important. Um, that a lot of people are confused by, and I wanted to hear the answer from you. Um, the, can you explain the stark difference between a publisher owning the song and a label owning the master? Because a lot of people are confused with that. They don't know what, what a publisher does versus what a label does. 
Um, okay. And, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Excellent question. Um, the label, because we talked now, we talked about you know, um, we're not quite with, finished with publishing, but um, the label controls. There are two copyrights um, that you have to um, be aware of when you're talking about records. There's a copyright for the sound recording the record, even if it's electronic, um, um, that was that was made and that belongs to the record company. And typically the record company has a copyright on that, that there's, it's a work made for hire by the artist. Let's, let's go back to that in a moment, because this is a good question. And again, this is a flyover kind of, kind of lecture. Um, the, the publisher, on the other hand, owns the copyright to the song that's embodied on the on the ma on the master or the or the record, so the two separate copyrights um, that 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 generate um, different royalties, and so the if it's a singer songwriter that writes her or his own music, uh, then that person when a, when a record company when a record is sold, it generates record royalties, but it will also generate publishing royalties. Um, um, in, in terms of, of mechanicals, and which played on the radio, publishing monies in terms of it, uh, performance monies that's, that travels through ASCAP and BMI, the uh, PROs, the Performing Rights Organizations. So, All right. Okay. So too, but in terms of who owns it, let's go back to records for a, for a while. This, this is this is this is very important, and I'm glad you you brought it up. Um, that you have to understand when the deal is over and they drop you after one record or two records, or the deal is over, the copyrights don't come back to you. The copyrights stay with the owner of the copyright, which is typically the record company. Now, more and more, and this is really changing rapidly, and, uh, and, and Taylor Swift kind of really brought this, brought this up for, you know, recently, um, there's some been pushback on, wait a second, why does a record company own it? Well, the record company owns it because they had the power and that's the way that was just standard. It was, and the lawyers and everybody accepted it for years. But more and more, and myself included, now we're talking about um, reversions. Very important and a beautiful word for a copyright owner. When does it revert to me? When does it come back to me? In the first draft, it'll be never. You know, it's ours and you get paid forever pursuant to the contract, which is when we sell it or where it's exploited. And exploited in, this, in, the, in the music business is a good thing. It just meant you know, getting it out there. Uh, it's not exploitation, but exploitation in the, in the bad sense was exploitation, exploitation in the good sense. But you, now more and more, I have no hesitation to say to a record company when I do a deal and to a publisher when I do a deal, that wait a second, yes, I'm assigning you the copyright but in seven years, I, you know, I want this back. Uh, and I'll say, seven years, George, come on, we keep this forever. And then maybe we'll do some horse trading and I'll, you know, I'll be satisfied with 15. It's a long time, but you know, you're talking about something, something that maybe, if it's, if it's not valuable, it doesn't turn out to be valuable, then it's just talk and it makes no difference in the end. Because it wasn't, it wasn't making more money. But in the, in the, you know, in the times that this becomes valuable, then you, boy, do you want this back? Because you can then give it to anybody else or self-publish it. You can hire your own lawyer and own whole team to do it for you and make the bulk of the money rather than, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the royalty you're getting from somebody, somebody else. And the same thing goes with publishing. You know, I'll say, I want it back after a certain period of time. And they'll, they'll say, well, we, you know, we don't want to do that. And if you have a bidding situation, you're in a perfect position. That's one in a hundred that you have a bidding situation. But if you're not, they're open to it now. And if they're open to it, let's discuss it. If you can't get it, then you look at your, you know, you look at your belly button and say, do we do it or not? And chances are you, you do do it, but you really, really try. And sometimes you do walk away from deals. Again, I've yep. been, you know, I've been, you know, the best thing I've done for some artists is say, you know, don't do this deal. Something better is coming down than the pike, and they have. Okay. So, versions and copyright yeah. ownership. There, they, there are two different th two different copyrights that are very very important. And when you off when you do a, when you do a, a sync license, when you synchronize this for a movie or a t or a, or a television show or a game. Um, or, an, or a commercial, 
the um, the advertiser or the agent for the advertiser is talking and looking for two copyrights, two licenses, one for the master and one for the song. You just can't go to one and just get the master and think you 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 took care of it. You better get to the publisher because the publisher will sue you for copyright infringement. Tell me about Tell it. Me about it. A high percentage of my life is spent trying to negotiate um, or connect with the uh, copyright owners for songs that I want to feature on Pure Mix. You know, um, these guys don't necessarily realize that, but you know, if you go uh, to Pure Mix and you see Green Day uh, and you see you know Andrew Sheps mixing Green Day, we had to go and negotiate with the publisher for the right of using the song and with the label for the right of using the recording, even though we're not even using the master, we're using the stems, the pre-mixed stems, and we have to do that, and then we pay them. And we pay them because we want everybody to get paid, because we make records, everybody at, at Pure Mix is a record maker in one way or another, um, and so we want to be a positive force in the business, but I can mm -hmm. tell you that we're in the process of mixing, uh, of uh, clearing a hip-hop song right now, uh, from a very famous, I'm not going to say the name because I'm not sure it's going to go through, from a huge, huge artist with a huge, huge song. And there are 23 co-publishers. 23 co-publishers. Of whom? Four. Oh, not, were, there, were there many writers? Yeah. Yeah. It's one hip-hop track. There's like 23 people in the room. There are 23 that's, kind of, that's kind of crazy. It's insane. It's insane. And so... Uh, it is a complicated world. Um, so I have a, a, a question for you that I think people um, are really, a lot of people are fuzzy about the role of a publisher. Um, can, well, we know what they do in theory, but what do they do in practice for their 25%? What is their function? It doesn't make sense. It's a very good question, Fab, um, because they do administer it. They control it and they do the, do the, do the deals. Um, but what they also will suggest is that they will tr do they will they will pitch it that they will try and get the songs to to um, um, to artists to managers um, to music supervisors um, to get it on a commercial or a or a television show or, or something like that and that they can that they will um, they will run with it and exploit it and get and, and make you make you make you money. Well, the reality is, and especially take for example, the big publishers who have millions of songs in their catalog. And some of them are by, you know, major, major by major artists. Do you think, I'd like someone to call me and say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Do you think that they have the staff, and we're talking about millions of songs to pay attention to a new signing? They don't. So you know, there's the, the the answer, and it's been a big question. What you know, what what do you know, what do you know, you know, publishers do? But there's so many more media and outlets for it now that you know maybe you know, you know, the publishers do have an um, inroad um, in in certain areas, but don't take it at face value that they will be pitching your songs. Especially think, especially especially major labels. Even though I'm I like to sign to major labels. Because the advances are big and they have the resources once you get yourself on the map. But they kind of, they kind of leave it to you and you can't rely on them to put you on the map, especially publishers. I think that's really important. These guys heard it in such a way from you who deals with that stuff every day. Um, so we, uh, um, did you have something you wanted to add to publishing, to your publishing segment? Or do you feel like this is well-rounded information and you've gotten your Well, just to remember that when the publishing deal is over, the copyrights and us is a reversion and do not come back. So that you, you're free, you're a free agent in terms of your new song that you write after a publishing deal is, is up. Uh, but the songs that fell under that, that publishing deal um, mm, uh, typically carry on for the life of the copyright. And there's a 35 year old, there's a 35 year uh, reversion that will allow you, if you follow certain protocols, um, to get it back. But 35 years is a lifetime, or half a lifetime. Yep. So, again, you can't really count, you know, look to that as, um, and that's to prevent people who signed. You know, as as baby, as young as young writers, and all of a sudden, their songs became 
um, 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 you know, um, evergreens, as they call it, you know, mm-hmm. legacy songs um, to, you know, to get to get more benefit out of what they really sold on the cheap early on. Yep. But even that gave, it gave publishers plenty of time. 35 years is a long time. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, and we hear lots of stories from, you know, big legacy artists um, to um, that are fighting to try and get their property back. Um, so I think that, um, so I promised you that it would be, you know, we would, we wouldn't last forever because you got to go back to, um, reading 80 page contracts, but, um, um, would you take a few minutes for a couple, there's a couple questions that I think are really interesting. Um, and that, that you can riff off that are very related to what we discussed. Um, if you might, um, the, the first top questions that we actually answered organically in our discussion, but the third question is this, check this out. If. Um, I don't know who wrote it. I want to give credit to the writer, but the system doesn't let me. Um, if I send an idea of a song to a producer or a songwriter and they steal it, can I do something about it? Well, I don't know what an idea for a song is. You know, a song is the ideas are not copyrightable. So if you're saying a, an idea about, you know, such and such event, or something like that, and you say, oh, you know, write about the virus, for example, or something like that, you know, just filling something that's so current. Um, you know, that's nothing that you can protect. So I, concepts, if, the key word was idea, not copyrightable. It has to be um, 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 in place and more concrete. It has to be, it has to be notes, it has to be a song. And an idea for a song. Okay, that's very because a lot of people are confused about that. Um, an artist I'm working with myself uh, right now was super confused about that. He's like, I can't. We have to have an agreement um, before I give you my ideas. And I'm like, I'm fine, but um, I'm not going to work. Actually, I'm probably well, not going to work. See, though, that that kind of thing is dangerous, and that's so that's so great because what happens if he gives you the idea? And he says, "Well, let you sign it. I want you know sign this confidentiality agreement or this recognition that it's it, it's mine and I gave it to you." And all of a sudden, he tells you something that you knew all along, or that you were thinking of, or was obvious, and now he's going to be able to hold that over you because you know you signed it when you had it, or anybody could have had it, and it wasn't that unique or interesting. Uh, that, that's that's a, that's that's one of the problems with these kind of you know um, um, those kind of those kind of agreements, confidentiality yes. agreement, or, or or if you use it, you know I have to be I have to be um, I have to be paid something. Yeah, it, it, it's a lawyer a, to tell you. Need a lawyer to tell you. It's just such a simple answer. Um, so. And a good question. a good question, but a very simple answer. Mm-hmm. All right. So we, while we were running um, our discussion, um, there were two polls, and uh, the first poll was, and then people in the in the room could uh, answer, you know, click yes, no to the poll. So I, I started the first one and said, statement: I've hired a music lawyer or entertainment lawyer to draft a contract for me before. People who answered yes are 25 percent. People who answered no are seventy five percent. Um, and then uh, to the question, do you have a standard mixing or production contract? Um, no, is 83% of people don't have a standard mixing or production contract. Um, a lot of people are worried about the cost of such a thing. And I think um, you can speak to that, but the I think that the cost of not having one is way higher. And I can speak in person that the cost of me waiting so long to hire George to make a standard production agreement for me was way, way, way higher by a factor of hundreds, if not thousands, than the cost of not having one. So um, a lot of people are really worried about the costs of hiring an entertainment lawyer, undermining, uh, basically taking so much of the small budget that he can't afford to work with people like you. How right. do you feel about that? And, and what's, what's, what's your answer to that? 
Right. Yeah. Well, I won't commit and go on, you know, and go on tape and saying that I would charge this or that. I, I won't do that because every, everything is, you know, different in terms of who this person is and what level they are at, um, which I pay attention to. Um, uh, and what the particulars um, particulars are, I can't tell you that I charge an, an hour. I can charge hourly, or I can charge, and and the hourly can be, you know, my, my standard hourly rate is fairly expensive, um, because I'm I'm ex experienced, um, but I'm also flexible. Uh, so and sometimes I just always say a flat rate, but I, listen, if if it's, if it's an established person comes to me, I should be charging more. I also know that person could um, could um, can pay that. Um, if if someone is fairly new and is quote struggling, I have to take that into account. If I want to if I want to do if I want to do the business, I might say no. I might say I can't afford it. I think what I suggest is that if anybody that's interested in working with me or with any lawyer, um, you know, just contact them. Explain who you are, what your situation. People will talk to you on, you know, on the phone. And if they won't want to talk to you on the phone, um, then forget about them. You know, they're not for you. Um, when someone calls me, and my my assistant says, "There's someone calling, and they're looking for a lawyer. They're they're a producer, a mixer, an artist. They're looking for a lawyer." Of course, that it seems so obvious to me. I get on the phone. I mean, I can probably figure out in five or ten minutes. I mean, I'm not the president of the United States, and no lawyer is, and nobody in this business, you know, is. You know, we have, we, we, we have time and we should have time, or you make time. And if you don't have time, you know, to discuss that, uh, then fine, you're not the lawyer for that person. But I think you would find that 90%, 75% of the lawyers um, will, you know, will respond to you. And, you know, when you put, you know, I happen to have my own practice um, and I do what I want with clients. But even when, you, when you're calling, say, a big firm, you know, they have junior lawyers, they have senior lawyers. And maybe you'll be, you know, given a junior lawyer who, you know, could work for less and um, will take your call because he's trying to build up his practice. So, you know, you should be able to find someone to talk to them about what it's going to cost. And it's an absolutely, you know, a question, it's absolutely a question you shouldn't be embarrassed about. You know, everybody that's in the business knows what the reality is. And you try and make, you know, you try and work it out that it makes sense for you. It makes sense for the person that's on the other side, on the other end of the call. That's awesome. And I think this is a, um, um, a very important statement on which, that we can absolutely wrap this amazing hour and a half or hour and 20 that you uh, you have given us. Thank you very much, George. Um, okay. Thank you for watching um, and people um, I hope you got a lot of information from this I did and I know all this because I discuss it with George all the time but I feel like I've learned more again today um, thank you thank you very much George um, this welcome. this will be available for replay guys for those of you who had bad internet or for those of you who um, had to you know go walk your dog I saw somebody was like I have to go I want to stay but I have to go so um, this will be on pure mix and we'll stay there and you'll be able to go uh, watch everybody is like saying lots and lots and lots of thank yous in the chat right now thank you guys um, uh, let me, let me um, just add, Fab, thank you and thanks thank you the audience for listening to me I appreciate it yeah thank you guys uh, and so just a quick um, uh, shameless plug tomorrow at 6 30 GMT which is 2 30 EST uh, we will have David Crosby here uh, with the Lighthouse Band, who's going to come discuss the um, the making of the last record we did together, which I was lucky enough to be invited to co-produce and mix and record and mix. So, um, so if you have nothing be be better to do, George, you should uh, you should come and watch that. If okay. not, I'll see you on the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming, and see you very soon. Cheers. Bye.